The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Well, welcome back for the, for the last hour in this, uh, in this course. Uh, you know, we've discussed all kinds of things about lasers, certainly not everything. I haven't touched on cue switching, uh, cavity dumping, and uh, techniques for mode locking, and so on. But I think, uh, I hope, if, if you didn't have too much of a background, now at least you can see that there's nothing that magical about lasers. That they all make sense. And, uh, and if you were on some desert island <laughs> with a bag of tricks, you could probably create a laser for yourself. Now. As I mentioned earlier, I want to change topics now. I want to switch to fiber optics, because fiber optics is playing a key role in our lives today. And I think it's, it's good for, for all sorts of people to know uh, how, uh, how fiber optics, uh, how it works, you know, how it works and, and some of the uh, developments have been going on in, in fiber optics, and maybe a few words about some applications of, uh, of fiber optics. So, so here is the, the uh, very short course on, on basics of fiber optics. So the first question one asks, well, what's a fiber? All right. Now, fibers uh, have been developed for, for many years, way before uh, lasers. And they basically look, look like this. If you look from, from the end, they look like they have a core, you see, which is uh, one type of glass, uh, and uh, of certain index, let's say index N1 and surrounded by another glass uh, of index N2 called the cladding. And then the, the cladding is surrounded by a jacket and depends on uh, the type of material that you use. Uh, but whatever, the jacket then protects the, uh, protects the cladding. The index, the refractive index N1 of the core is bigger than N2. Uh, sometimes N2, the, the, the cladding material is just plain silicon dioxide. Uh, uh, and the index, uh, uh, the material in, in the core is silicon dioxide plus uh, some impurity with germanium dioxide to raise, to raise the index. So the question is, what's going on in here? Why play with, with all the, uh, these indices? So the, the key thing here is a uh, total internal reflection. All right, total ref uh, the propagation of light in fibers based on total internal reflection. So let's, let's then uh, review it. Uh, here's a ray of light. Uh, hitting the uh, surface, the interface here between N1 and N2, between the core and the, and the cladding. If this angle, if this incidence angle is bigger than the critical angle, then the light will be reflected and bounce around until it comes out the other end. And uh, because, just like going from glass uh, to air. And the, th the critical angle is given, as we remember from high school, as uh, sine to the minus 1 of n2 over n1, where n2 is the, in the smaller index and n1 is the, is the bigger one. If this angle of incidence is smaller than theta critical, then there will be some transmission of light, and not all the light will be, will be reflected. The, uh, just to remind you some more, uh, of uh, what's going on. Let me remind you of the, of the perfect mirror. When you have a perfect mirror, the light comes in, then essentially close to 100% of the light gets reflected, and the reflectivity is close to 100%, as I say, is one as a function of angle of, of incidence. But if you have, again, the, the glass-air interface now, we're coming from the glass side, then as we vary this, this angle, the angle of incidence, then the, the reflectivity uh, uh, of this interface then depends on the polarization. But right now, we're not going to get involved with polarization. But basically starts, let's say, between glass air, starts at like 4%. And for one polarization, goes through 0, which is the Brewster angle here, and then rises uh, at the theta critical to 100%. And for the other polarization, uh, the, then it, it doesn't quite go to 0, but again, still rises and goes to 100% at the theta critical. So it doesn't matter which polarization. The, both polarization will go to 100% uh, for theta critical and, and beyond. And that's what we take advantage of in fibers. And let me tell you, this is really 100%, because you wouldn't get such low-loss fibers if this weren't. Now, the other interesting thing that I want to point out 
uh, again from high school stuff, is that there is what we call evanescent wave here. Uh, there's a field that is, propagates in the, in the vacuum or in the air here, uh, but essentially just goes in and comes back again. It's not a loss, it's just that the, uh, the, in, when you have a glass-air interface, there is a field that does penetrate, but it's still not considered as a loss, but, and, then, and then, uh, but then comes back here and gives us 100%, while in a perfect reflector there is no field present on the other side because the, the light, 100% of the light gets reflected at the interface. Okay, so if you keep that in mind, there is an, an evanescent field, there's a field penetration into the lower index medium, the smaller index medium, in this case it's air. All right, so with this as, uh, as background, now let's look at the, the propagation in a, in a fiber. Now, uh, uh, it's not the, like I showed you here, exactly like I showed you, is the ray, the ray approximation. But basically, uh, when you do the calculations, what you get is a, uh, is a, uh, a mode, essentially, like, just like the one in lasers. It's a, a field distribution here where that peaks at the center of the core and also uh, uh, extends a little bit into the, uh, the evanescent field. This is the evanescent field. It extends into the cladding. So, so, uh, so you can see this is the side of, uh, size of the core, but you see the orange, this orange, if you can uh, see it as orange, it basically extends beyond the size of the core, and that's what we call single mode uh, propagation. Okay, here's the field distribution, here's the side of the mode. So it extends a little bit into, into the cladding. Most of it, let's say, goes into the core, part of it goes into the cladding, and propagates right down the fiber. I mean, this ray idea is fine for explanation, but basically, when you, when you do the calculation, proper calculation, that's what you get. You get this for the uh, lowest order uh, mode. Now, the, uh, the how, uh, how does the light look like when it comes out? Then, then basically, let's go back to the ray picture. Well, the ray picture, remember we said that the angle has to here be uh, either equal to the critical or, or bigger. And then that then determines the, the acceptance angle going in because, uh, because rays of light coming in outside this, this cone here will, be, then will, will not undergo total internal reflection, complete total internal reflection, and will, will be in trouble because they won't propagate for too far and they'll be attenuated. Now, uh, for, the, for the light that is within this cone here, and by the way, this cone is uh, referred to as the numerical aperture, Na, for the fiber, and Na is basically the N0, the, the refractive index of air or vacuum outside, sine, uh, sine uh, theta 0. And, and, and theta 0 is half this angle here, which is determined by then the index difference and so on. To, uh, so get us to the angle here to be bigger than the critical angle, all right? So, uh, so then, that, then this acceptance angle here, the light within this cone when will propagate uh, and, uh, within the fiber, and when it comes out, essentially it comes out just like this cone here, again with an angle of 2 theta 0. So the light coming out from a fiber is, uh, expands uh, pretty fast. That's using the ray picture. If you look at the, the, uh, the, pr the true picture, what happens actually, you bring in light that you focus into, into the core, even though it spills over the core a little bit because of the evanescent wave, then will propagate down the fiber and then will come out on the other side, almost like, like it came in. So, uh, and this is very close, uh, close to the diffraction angle, which is of the order of lambda over d, where d is the size as we discussed way early in this, uh, in this course. So even though it propagates as a, as a collimated beam in the fiber, but as soon as it leaves the fiber, it, it, expands, uh, it expands very, very rapidly. All right, so that's basically then how, uh, in a simple way, how, how light uh, propagates. Now, the fact that we have low loss, where does that come from? And, and let me show you some data on, on low loss uh, propagation. If you, if you plot the loss, uh, in, in propagation as dBs per kilometer and as a function of wavelength, you find that there is a certain wavelength like 1.55 or 1.3, the loss is, is very low. It's about, let's say, 0.2% or 0.1% or so per kilometer at, at these uh, wavelengths. Now, 0.1%, uh, 0.1 dB, I'm sorry, 0.1 dB per kilometer is like 2% per kilometer loss. And that's, that's very small. That's much smaller than propagating in, in wires. And the reason why it's small is, first of all, is because the, the, the total internal reflection is really 100%. 
All right? there, is, there is no loss because of that. And the reason there's any loss at all is because you're, you're squeezed in from one side. On this side, you have what we call Rayleigh scattering. Uh, the fact that, uh, I don't want to get into it right now, but the fact that, that you get scattering essentially from, uh, from the uh, fluctuations of density fluctuations within the glass. That's on one side. So as the wavelength gets shorter, the scattering gets larger and larger, and then you're in trouble. That's the same reason why the sky is blue and so on. Now on the other side, on this side here, not shown, is, the, uh, is essentially the material uh, absorption uh, or the infrared absorption and so on for the, for the let's say, for the quartz for the glass. So you're, you're boxed in on one side, you have Rayleigh scattering. The other side going up is the material absorption, and that's why you have the lowest loss around here. And that's about the best you can do. If you want to reduce this loss from, let's say, 0.1 or 0.2 dBs per kilometer, then you have to use other materials, and materials whose material absorption is further into the infrared. So I'm afraid uh, uh, we're not going to get uh, into the visible uh, and have uh, low loss. Because, the, uh, because of the Rayleigh scattering. So it's going to be, if we're going to go any, we're going to do better than this, we're going to go further into, into, the, uh, into the infrared, which means we have to have the right sources and, and the uh, components and so on to work in the, in the infrared and, and, the, uh, and then deeper in, uh, infrared. Okay, so, uh, so now we know a little bit about the loss in the, in the fiber. Uh, uh, and uh, basically it's very, very low loss uh, if, if the fiber is, is constructed very carefully in the sense that it's, uh, it's uh, uh, synthesized from, from pure materials and not just uh, any old piece of glass that you find somewhere. Okay, synthesize it from scratch. All right, and it's drawn together and then you, you have this core that has slightly a higher index than the, the cladding. So you think everything is fine, but there's, there's, there's a problem and that we, we want to discuss. Just like with lasers, everybody here wants the, the lowest order mode, which is the single spot that comes out. But uh, what we find that there are other uh, intensity distributions that come out. And again, these are called the transverse modes that can propagate in a fiber, satisfying Maxwell's uh, equations and so on, and the boundary conditions in a, in a fiber. And, for, and, and this is called, if a fiber is then, then allows these modes to propagate, then it's called a multi-mode uh, fiber. Single-mode fiber is the fiber that only allows this to go. All the others have high loss and they, and they don't go. So now let's, let's uh, spend a couple of minutes on, uh, on single-mode and multi-mode fibers before I show you some demonstrations. The, uh, the, in, in this case here, I have this is the core and that's the cladding. And the index of the core is, is N1, which is higher than the index of the cladding, which is N2 down here. Now, uh, the, on the x-axis here, I'm plotting what we call the v-number. What's the v-number? Right now, we're not, have, we don't have time to go into any detail, but the v-number is essentially a, a parameter that depends on, on 1 over the wavelength of the light, on the d sub c, which is the diameter of the core, and the square root of n1 squared, that's n1 being the core index, and n2 is the cladding index. The square root of n1 squared minus n2 squared. Now, turns out when this V number has a certain value, let's say 2.4 or, or so on, then you only get, uh, if, it's, if, it's, if it's that value or less, then you only get single mode propagation. All the other modes have uh, too much loss and they, uh, they, don't, they don't propagate. So a single mode fiber then is one where the V parameter, which means the, uh, the size of the core, the wavelength, and the difference of the, in, in the indices are such that gives you a v, a v parameter smaller than 2.4, and that's single mode. If you, if the, uh, let's say you change the wavelength, you make it shorter or so on, V will go up and then you'll start getting all these uh, 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 multi-modes, or the, just like I showed you, I showed you before. And, uh, and, uh, and then you'll be in trouble, so for some application, not all applications. The, uh, in this particular case, what I show you is the field distribution and the intensity distribution uh, uh, in, the, in the fiber. Here's the core, here's the size of the core, and that's the cladding. And you can see here, depending on, on the parameters that I choose, uh, uh, some light uh, in, in this uh, lowest order mode uh, in the field will, will propagate in the, in the cladding, and so with the, uh, essentially the intensity. For the next high order mode, okay, which is similar to the laser cavity modes, the field distribution is something like this, and again, 
part of it will, will propagate into, into, uh, in the cladding. And when you square it up, if you look at the intensity, it looks like this. That's what the two spots look like. That. But the field is really one is, let's say, positive. The other one is, is negative. And what you see here is that the, the uh, size of, the, uh, of this uh, uh, higher order mode is bigger than the lowest order mode. And more of it will propagate in the cladding than in the core. So in terms of propagation constant, or how fast they propagate, uh, this one propagates more in the, in the, in the uh, cladding than this one. And since the index is smaller in the cladding than in the core, then this one will go faster than this one. And that's a problem in, in uh, communications, in using uh, transverse modes. In this, in this next uh, 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 graphic, I show how much, again, as a function of V number, but how much of the light propagates in the core and how much propagates in the cladding. So again, for V number below this 2.4 or so, the, for single mode operation, it turns out that when the V number is very, very small, most of the light, I'm plotting here uh, power in the core, transmitting the core over the total power propagated uh, through the fiber, then it turns out when the V number is very small, even the single mode propagates more in the, in the cladding than the core. Okay, because uh, the ratio P core to P is very small. And as I approach uh, the uh, multi-mode operation, the, the single mode travels, let's say, about 80% uh, or so in the core, but not in the cladding. Now, when the, multi, when the onset of multi-modes comes about, then the multi-mode will propagate mostly in the, in the cladding first, more in the cladding than in the core, and then as I increase the V number, they again will start coming in to the propagating in the core, and, and their index starts to approach the index of the single mode. But in, always, it's lower than that of the, of the single mode. Okay, so they all travel essentially at, at different speeds, and also the transverse modes occupy, they travel more in the, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, cladding than in the than in the than the core as compared with the with a single mode. Now to give you to give you an a, an example uh, for single mode fiber, uh, let's say for a diameter of core diameter of five microns and a wavelength of 0.8 microns, uh, you need the, the you need n1 minus n2 the difference in the index to be 10 to the minus three. Now if you want to make uh, the core diameter uh, larger, then you're going to end up with n1 minus n2 even smaller. So it's very tricky to make uh, uh, single mode uh, fibers. Otherwise, you have multi mode operation. All right, so now that I have talked about, about single mode and, and, uh, and uh, multi mode fibers, I have uh, two demonstrations for you. One basically shows single mode fiber and coupling into it and what the output looks like and also we bend the fiber and show that whatever you do is still single mode. It doesn't change on you. All that happens is that you kick light out and, and you reduce the intensity. But when we come to multi-mode, something else happens. So now at first, let's go to the single mode uh, fiber demonstration. In this demonstration, we're going to illustrate the propagation of light in a fiber, a glass fiber. As we know today, optical fibers have a lot of low loss, very low loss of the order of uh, one or two dBs per kilometer. And of course, they're being used for communication as well as other applications like sensors. So the setup we have is a, uh, is a laser, a helium neon laser over here. Here's the output from, from the laser. We're going to reflect it by this mirror and this mirror, and then pass it through a lens. This lens over here focuses the light into the fiber end. And if we can take a close-up of what's going on over here, what you would see is then a lens. This lens then focusing the light and fiber, and the fiber is very close to the lens. And then the rest of the fiber is here. Right? So here is the, the rest of the fiber. Now this fiber, uh, in fact, what you're seeing over here is the, uh, essentially the plastic jacket. The fiber core is about four microns in, in diameter, and the cladding is 125 microns. And the rest that you see here is the, is the plastic jacket. That's why it looks so, so visible, uh, because it's so thick. 
the other end of the fiber then uh, goes into this holder and the, and the chuck here. It's in a, hole, a fiber holder in a chuck and the output of the, of the fiber then is over here onto this, uh, onto this little screen. <clears throat> now, if, if we can, maybe we can take a close look at the, at the fiber end here. What which shows that uh, what you see over here, uh, in fact, let me point to it. What you see over here is the, the cladding. Essentially, we've stripped the jacket and what you see here is just the cladding, and this is the 125 microns, while over here, over here, is the, is the, the fiber with the plastic, with the plastic jacket. So when you remove the plastic jacket, then you have essentially what you're seeing is the, it's just the 125 micron cladding. All right, so this is then uh, the fiber, and there's the output of the, of the fiber. Now what we see, if we can then enhance this and bring it bring it in, what we see is the, uh, is the single mode uh, behavior of, of a fiber. Uh, and it looks like, almost like a, a Gaussian kind of uh, spot. Not quite Gaussian, but it looks like uh, a Gaussian kind of spot. Now what I'm doing now uh, is just, is just adjusting the, the uh, coupling into, into the fiber. And it's very touchy because, as I said, the core is only about four, four microns. All right, so this is what then a single mode uh, uh, fiber, the output from a single mode fiber looks like. And it, as I misalign here, it doesn't make any difference. All you get is just a uh, loss in intensity. The shape of the mode stays, stays the same. So remember, the core is four microns, cladding is 125. The wavelength of the light is 6328 angstroms, and the core-to-index uh, difference is about one part in, in 10 to the 3. So this way you can show that indeed you get uh, single-mode propagation. Now I would like to illustrate some interesting phenomena about fibers. So if we get the camera to look over here, I want to illustrate how touchy uh, uh, is the propagation of light in a, in a single mode fiber. Now here is here's a piece of fiber and you can see that there's no light uh, scattered from the fiber. Now all I have to do is bend the fiber, bend the fiber and you're beginning to see light that gets, gets transmitted out of the fiber, gets essentially kicked out the fiber and uh, because, uh, because of the bend. Now and, and, and the reason for that, because it's, you, you start uh, going against the rules of uh, propagation of light in a fiber. For example, if you take the ray uh, explanation, is that what you're doing, you are uh, exceeding or, or you're changing the angle of light uh, with respect to the, to, the, to, the, uh, to the fiber, which means that if you're uh, if you're below the critical angle, then you, uh, the light is no longer totally internally reflected and therefore gets kicked out. All right, so here it is. It's very dramatic. As soon as you put a little bend in this fiber, you can, you can kick out a lot of light. In fact, there's the glow uh, right here. Now, if we can bring in the, the output of the fiber into the inset over here. Now, you can see that as I increase the, the bend, all right, you can see that the intensity, here yeah, I'll do it even more, the intensity then drops quite a bit, which means I've kicked out almost all, all the light by simply putting a bend into, into the fiber. So the, the illustration here then shows that if you leave the fiber alone without sharp bends, everything is fine. If you put in a bend, then you can kick out a lot of light and then not much will be, will be, will be transmitted. So you have to be careful, you don't put it too tight a bend, otherwise your fiber is brittle and you break the fiber. So you have to be, be careful how you, how you do this. In this previous demonstration then, what we had was a single mode, single mode fiber. Which means that it's a fiber that satisfied this V number being uh, less than 2.4 or so. And, uh, 
and uh, because of the, again the choice of uh, the core diameter, the wavelength, and the difference in the in the in the indices. Now, in this next demonstration, we're going to uh, violate this. We're going to uh, create a V that is bigger than uh, than this value here. By uh, in our case, we did it by choosing a fiber that has a that's a bigger core diameter. But we could have also done it with uh, by changing the wavelength. And if you just sh shorten the wavelength, go more into into the uh, into the blue side of the spectrum, then you can uh, you, then you start to see uh, transverse modes like I uh, I showed you uh, I showed you before. Okay, and I think now uh, we're ready to uh, have fun with a multimode fiber. Now we've replaced the previous fiber with another one. The only difference between this fiber and the previous one is that the core diameter is now a little bit bigger. It's about six microns instead of four microns in the previous fiber. Setup is exactly the same. Again, we have the laser here getting reflected by this mirror and this mirror into the lens, into this fiber, this new fiber, and then the, the output of the fiber goes onto the screen. So let's now take a look at the output of this fiber. Aha. Uh -huh. So what first thing we see that doesn't look like a single mode at all, that single low. And if I change the, the adjustment, if we can have the camera looking at my adjustments, then you see that I can get a variety of uh, uh, of shapes. All I'm doing is changing the adjustment. And I can get a variety of shapes and clearly it's not like what we had before, the single mode beh behavior that we had before. And this is then the so-called multi-mode. What you're seeing are, are different transverse modes that, are, that can propagate in, in this fiber because the core diameter is bigger. But I'm going to leave it to you then to explain uh, why exactly why you get higher, or higher, modes, higher transverse modes propagated in this, uh, in this fiber. Again, the wavelength is the same. The only, thing, the only difference is that the core diameter is, is bigger. You can see this one here, you get a nice dark line in the middle. And then, then if I align it over here, you can see it's blobby. It's a mixture of modes. That's why you don't see a uh, sharp dark line in the middle, but you get a uh, mixture of modes. While remember in the other one, no matter what I did in the alignment, uh, it was still single mode uh, coming out, just one lobe coming out. All right, now multi mode fibers have uh, many applications also, but for today, for a lot of sophisticated sensor applications and communications, uh, one uses, one generally uses single mode fibers. So here, here's a, here's a pretty, pretty mode with a dark line down the, uh, down the middle. Now what I would like to do is show how, how touchy uh, this fiber is to, to uh, bending. In fact, if we take a look at the fiber here, as soon as I just press on it, if we get, take a close look at it, if I just press on it, uh, I can kick light, kick light out. If I just simply press on it, I can kick uh, some light out. So it's very touchy to, to, to stress and, and to bend. What I would like to do then is show that I can kick out some of the transverse modes by, by simply bending or stressing the fiber. What I'm going to do is then bend this fiber, and if you watch in the, in the inset, you can see that the intensity will go down, but if I keep increasing the bend, I end up with single mode, with a single mode propagation, but, but weak. And this illustrates that you can strip off the high order modes uh, by simply uh, bending, bending the fiber. But the penalty is you get uh, much less light uh, getting propagated. So here we have single mode propagation, and here we have multi-mode or mixture of multi-modes that are propagating in the, in the fiber. Again, you can see that the, there's a lot of light that gets kicked out, has to be kicked out of the fiber. You can see the the bend absolutely glows. In fact, this, this bending 
effect on, on the transmission of light in a fiber can be used as a, as a sensor. A sensor of uh, pressure, sensor of stress, bends, and, and what have you. All right, so then in, in summary, we've looked. Well, that's, uh, that was all about transverse modes in fibers. It's not uh, easy to see these uh, modes in normal fibers, but uh, I think this was a nice opportunity uh, for you to see them and how, how they get uh, manipulated. So what we know now about fibers then is that there's low loss because uh, the material is correct. We go, the, let's say, the right wavelength and we have the, let's say, lowest loss, if you need the lowest loss. For a lot of other applications like sensors and so on, you know, the, the fact that the low loss is not the most critical fact. But for, certainly for communications and long distance propagation, that is, that is very critical. And then we also learned that that we have to be careful with this V number so that we make sure that we have, let's say, when we need it, we have single mode uh, propagation. See, the problem with these multi-modes, they travel at different speeds, and then, as, as we showed, and then, uh, and then it prevents you from, uh, from using these fibers for wideband communication. So for wideband communication, you really need uh, the single mode. And also what's nice about uh, propagating it around 1.5 microns or so is that the, even the refractive index, uh, uh, the, the variations uh, in there is, uh, is, is also small. So it's, it's, a, it's a nice region to propagate for, for communication applications. But just fibers alone is not everything. You still have to make connections. You know, like couplers, you have to have other components and, and so on. So let's now spend, spend a, a few minutes on, on uh, fiber optic components, like couplers, because if you want to split the light by 50-50 or 80-20 or, or so on, you need these directional couplers all done with fibers. You need uh, polarizers because you don't want to come out of the fiber, go through a bulk optic polarizer and go back into the fiber again. You'd like to create polarizers right on the fibers. You like to also control polarization. Uh, you'd like to maybe create phase modulators, frequency shifter, and so on, all in fibers. Now, I'm not going to have time to talk about all these things, but I'm just going to talk a little bit about couplers, maybe a little bit about phase, uh, phase modulators. So how do you make, now, how do we make a, a, uh, a coupler? How do we transfer light? Let's say we have a, f uh, a fiber in here, and we have a core in it, and we're propagating down the core and normally the light would come out here. But now I'd like to transfer the light to, to another fiber. So what one, one does here, you bring the, another fiber uh, close to, to this one. Now, if with, with fibers, uh, as we said before, they have a core and they have a cladding, and the cladding is usually much bigger than the core. The core is usually a few microns. The cladding, is, uh, as I mentioned in the, demo, in the demo, is about 125 microns. So if you bring that, close to this one, then the, the, uh, the two uh, cladding spacing will not let you pr uh, transfer any light from one fiber to the other. So in order to transfer light, what you have to do, take advantage of this evanescent wave, the part of the evanescent wave that's traveling in the cladding. So what you have to do then, you have to shave off the cladding so that the ev that, that evanescent wave in, in this fiber here, fiber one, Okay, if, if, the, if you shave enough of the cladding, this evanescent wave can start propagating in the, uh, in the uh, second fiber, in fiber two. So when it does that, then you can transfer energy to, to fiber two. And depending on this interaction length, length of the interaction, the closeness of the two cores, uh, then you can transfer 100% uh, and back to zero. So in this plot here, we show that as a function of either the separation between the cores, D sub cores, the core separation, or as a function of the interaction length for a given core separation, you can transfer as much as 100% uh, of the light. You can make 100% of the light come out at port 2 instead of port 1. And if you keep changing this uh, coupling, then you can bring it back to zero again and up again and so on. So that, uh, so that by, uh, by selecting the, the right uh, separation between the cores and the right interaction length, then you can have, uh, you can transfer any amount of light that you want. 
and uh, and this is great because it's uh, it's pretty low loss and is used of course all the time today uh, these couplers can be what we call the polish type or the fuse type and so on there are different types of couplers but basically they work on that principle of bringing the two cores uh, close enough together so that the evanescent wave that little tail of, the, of that field distribution then will propagate in the in the other core and will drive the dipoles over there all right so that's basically the principle of a uh, of a uh, of a coupler all right and uh, now i wanted to uh, just say again a few words about phase modulators now uh, phase modulators well how do you do that how do you uh, modulate the phase of the light propagating in the fiber well again there are many ways because if we stretch the fiber if we do something to the fiber uh, we can uh, change the essentially the index let's say in the uh, in the fiber or change the physical length of the fiber and then we get a change in phase delta phi that's proportional to either change in the uh, the length of the fiber or change in the index uh, of the fiber one way of doing this is to take the fiber and wrap it around a piezoelectric crystal if we put a voltage between the inside and the outer uh, surfaces of this crystal, then we can uh, change the diameter of this uh, of this uh, cylinder, and then in this way we can change the uh, the physical length uh, of the fiber, or by stressing it, you know, essentially cha could change also the index. But whatever, uh, uh, yet you get a change in the phase of the light propagating by by uh, applying a voltage, either DC voltage or sinusoidal voltage, to this. Uh, cylinder, piezoelectric cylinder. The, uh, another type of, uh, of piezoelectric device is a, is a sheet, is a, is a piezoelectric strip or sheet where the fiber is just uh, attached to, bonded to this, uh, you don't have to be bonded that rigidly, to this, to this sheet. And then by applying a voltage between the upper and the lower uh, surface, you can again stretch the, uh, stretch the fiber and then you can essentially modulate the, the light that's propagating. So, uh, so that's a very neat way. You don't have to break the fiber. It's still, it's still intact, and you can get uh, phase, uh, phase modulation. Now, uh, and then as I say, uh, said before, there are all kinds of uh, neat uh, devices that, that uh, use fibers. So you can make polarizers, frequency shifters, and, uh, and so on. But now there is another field that uh, is gaining momentum a lot, and that's called integrated optics because uh, sometimes to, to make these uh, all fiber uh, uh, couplers, all fiber devices, becomes a little tricky and very delicate. So it would be nice to, to replace them with something that's more, more robust. So I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, integrated optic components. And, uh, and what, uh, what are uh, integrated uh, optics, first of all? Uh, let, me, let me then uh, explain to you a little bit about what's an integrated optic waveguide is. So in this case, the, instead of, it's, not, it's not a fiber, but basically, uh, let's say you start with, with, with uh, some material like glass, and then you indiffuse uh, some impurity that raises the index. And if this is controlled, uh, then using photolithographic techniques and so on, uh, that you can raise the index over here. So if you look from the side, you have a material that has a little higher index than, than uh, the cladding over here, and then you can propagate light down this, uh, this uh, waveguide. It becomes a waveguide, and, uh, and then the light is guided through the waveguide, just like in a fiber, because the index here is higher than ones on the side. And then you can coat this and protect it and so on. But the principle is that you can get single mode or multi mode uh, uh, waveguides in a, in a substrate. And it's rigid, doesn't go anywhere, and you can do all kinds of things with it. So now, with this, with this idea here, uh, you, can, uh, you can create a, uh, a directional coupler, uh, either fixed or variable. Again, you can create polarizer by preventing certain polarizations, the, or one polarization from, from going by attenuating it. Uh, you can create uh, phase modulators, frequency shifters, intensity modulators, and so on, all using integrated optics. So let's look at, uh, at, a, at, a, at an example. Here again is, is the substrate, and here's the waveguide. Now, if this material here is, is uh, before even I get to what I want to talk about, is that you have to first couple 
coupled to this waveguide. Remember, the core can be very small, just a few microns. So you have to take the output from the fiber and couple it into, into this core. So that's a tricky uh, device. But again, people have found uh, nice techniques to, to do that. So basically, you want a fiber to couple into this and, and this to couple into the fiber going out. If you can do that and, and, and these couplers stay, uh, stay uh, together, then you, you've got something. All right, so now how do you create a phase modulator here? Now, if this material is, for example, is slightly electro-optic or electro-optic, then by putting electrodes here and applying a, a voltage difference between them, then you can change the index, either in the cladding or in the core, and then, and then uh, just by simply applying a voltage. And this way, you can then phase modulate the light propagating in this section. You can do it pretty fast, and then you can get very fast uh, phase modulators. And if you ramp the phase and so on using ceridine techniques that we hear about today, you can also do frequency shifting uh, quite easily using this device. Now, if you want to use it as a coupler or, or as an intensity modulator and so on, you have to uh, combine uh, several waveguides, two waveguides together, and then you can create a coupler and so on. But here I've chosen uh, this example here where I have one guy that looks like this and then the other guy that looks like that. Now, if I put light in, in, in one arm, then, then again, normally it would come out on, uh, 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 over here, uh, but depending on the closeness of these two cores, then I can get some light that will be coupled into this other side and will come out over here. So this is a, uh, let's say, a fixed coupler. Uh, if, you, uh, if you want to have a variable coupler, again, if this material of the substrate is, is electro-optic, then again, putting electrodes on the material, then you can change the, the essentially the index here, between the, t between the cores, and, uh, and this way will change the, uh, the coupling. The coupling ratio then will change depending on the index. So I can couple more light or less light by applying a, a voltage. So this is a neat little device. And, uh, and then there's also other applications. Uh, you can also use it as a, as a for example, as an intensity uh, modulator by, uh, by, again, uh, applying a variable voltage here, and then you can transfer, you can vary the transfer of light from here to, uh, from this port uh, to this port, and, and so on. So it has many, many applications, sensors, and so on. So this is a, a very important uh, field in, in fiber optics, as long as you can, as long as you know how to couple uh, back into fibers and in, in, a, in a rigid way without any reflections or, or big reflections and, and so on. So it's a very, very, very exciting uh, uh, development. Now, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about uh, uh, fibers for, for sensors, special fibers for sensors. So far, the fibers I've talked about are good for, for communication. Okay, single mode fibers, low loss, and, and so on. But for sensors, there are all kinds of, uh, of fibers that have been uh, uh, developed. Uh, and it's a field that is uh, growing. It's a little difficult to get started, but it is, it is growing. Now, the, uh, the, this, today we have what we call polarization-maintaining fibers. These are fibers that will, will, if you launch the field at one polarization, will stay in that polarization. Uh, there are fibers that, uh, that will only propagate one one uh, polarization. The other polarization will not propagate. It's too much loss. And so you have essentially like a very long uh, polarizer, linear polarizer. Then we get to what we call coated fibers. These are fibers that are coated with special materials that if they are p placed in a certain environment, then that material will, uh, will start stretching and will stretch the fiber with it. And then you can make a uh, sensor for that particular species that the, th the fiber is dipped into. You can also get uh, 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 other types of coatings. You can coat the material with, uh, with, uh, with a conducting uh, material like copper or so on. You can make it more sensitive to temperature. You can coat the fiber with piezoelectric material, and you can make it into a phase modulator or magnetostrictive material, and so on. You can do all, put all kinds of coatings on fibers and, and use them for sensors. And the jacketed fiber is almost like the, the fiber. You, pu you put it with a jacket, and then you make the jacket sensitive to, just like I mentioned before, to the, to the species that the fiber is dipped into. Uh, 
Then there are, today it's a big field now, the doping of, uh, of fibers. And, uh, for example, if you dope uh, glass fiber with neodymium, you have, uh, and you can uh, pump it with, uh, with a laser, with a semiconductor laser, then you can have, you can have a, essentially a neodymium laser, a fiber laser. And uh, you can make them into a, uh, linear lasers or ring lasers and so on uh, today by doping, uh, doping the fiber. And, and the, this is the, the background for the fiber optic lasers because you dope the fiber with all kinds of uh, 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 impurities and then you you get then you pump you have to pump them and then usually these are pumped uh, with a semiconductor laser or some other laser and then you can create all sorts of lasers so you got to watch this this field now it's going to be it's going to be very big then uh, there's another type of, uh, of fiber where you expose the cladding you shave off the cladding expose the core all right. So, so by exposing the core means that you're exposing the evanescent wave that I've talked about before, and that can be used. That tail of the evanescent wave can be used to uh, to uh, interact with uh, vapor or gas or liquid or whatever that is placed in, and you can use that as a as a chemical sensor. And then we have twin core fibers where the two cores are close, and then you can transfer light from one core to the other all the way down the fiber, and this can be used for uh, for temperature, stress. And and, uh, and so on. As I say, this is a, this is a huge field, and I think we need a whole uh, one day uh, on uh, uh, course on uh, on fibers. So so now I'm getting close to to the end, uh, and I hope I've got some ideas across about the basics of fibers without again without using math, without scaring you off. But obviously, if if uh, if you have interest in these things, you have to consult the literature or take, uh, take other courses. Uh, in the few minutes remaining, I would like to talk about just a few words about some future uh, developments both in lasers and, and fiber optics. Uh, the, uh, in terms of lasers, uh, certainly we're going to see the rise, and we're already seeing the rise, of uh, semiconductor lasers you know, for all sorts of applications, CDs and so on, but we're also we're going to see them replacing the uh, red helium neon laser. Today they're already available and in fact you see them as pointers and so on. Uh, and, uh, and, and so they have very neat little devices and for applications that don't require strict uh, wavelength stability and what have you, I mean the, these, these are great uh, lasers. We're also seeing and we'll see m much more semiconductor lasers that are used to pump solid state lasers and fiber lasers, waveguide lasers and, and so on. And this is a very nice application for semiconductor lasers because, again, you don't have to worry about the, the stability of wavelength and so on. And then they can, they can uh, pump very well-behaved uh, solid-state uh, uh, lasers. And today these can be also very big. They don't have to be very small. They can be very big and you have the array of semiconductor lasers that will, will pump them. And then we go from the big to the small. We have even microchip lasers. They're very tiny crystals, and then they are pumped again with, let's say, semiconductor lasers or other lasers. But they're very tiny, and they can be single frequency and tunable and so on. And the fiber optic lasers, well, we already, we already mentioned there are all sorts of materials being looked at and, uh, and pumping uh, sources. And then the thin film waveguides. Well, we've talked about waveguides. All you have to do is you dope that waveguide, pump it, with an with a, with a optical pump, and then you've got yourself a, a laser in that, in that substrate. And then we're, uh, vacuum ultraviolet lasers are uh, very important in medical applications and other applications, and we're seeing lots of uh, new developments uh, in here, and also X-ray lasers. You know, the early, uh, early stages, they classify the development, but now I think uh, the literature now we, we see all kinds of work going on in uh, X-ray lasers with again completely uh, exciting area of, uh, of applications for X-ray lasers. Now this is the lasers. Now in terms of applications, the uh, you know I mentioned before fiber optic communication. That's a huge application and we're going to see uh, I think uh, not that far uh, uh, we're going to see that their homes and all that will be linked with, uh, with fiber optic uh, uh, cables. And this way we can have huge bandwidth that's uh, going to be uh, transmitted in, uh, in these fibers and then uh, we can send all kinds of information all over the place. 
Uh, this area is in materials processing, again because of the availability of a variety of lasers, that, is, uh, that certainly uh, is increasing and, uh, and uh, the variety is also increasing. Uh, and medical procedures, is, uh, if you keep up with what's going on, it's, it's, it's incredible what the uh, lasers are being used for procedures and for diagnostics. And, uh, and so on. Now here's a, here's a tough area, data processing. Uh, lasers are being used, but, uh, but hopefully uh, the, uh, the, uh, it will increase more. You can take very fast Fourier transforms, optical techniques, but again you have the implementation of them is not, is not that easy. Uh, now sensors, I've already mentioned some words about sensors, but uh, not just fiber optic sensors, but all kinds of optical sensors. They are, they are uh, incredible devices in the sense that, that they're not affected by, especially the fiber optic sensors, they're not affected by um, electromagnetic interference and, uh, and they can be used in all sorts of uh, hostile kind of uh, environments that uh, normal electrical sensors would not, would not work at all because there will be uh, affected by uh, the electromagnetic I interference. Um, the, uh, also because uh, fiber optics, uh, fibers have low loss, you can have uh, all kinds of distributed uh, sensors and, uh, and, uh, and, and so on because the, uh, the, the, the fiber, as I say, doesn't have any loss so you can place sort of uh, sensors all over the place and collect data from a large uh, area. Now, I mentioned earlier in precision positioning. This is based on interferometry, laser interferometry. Using laser interferometry, you can uh, uh, monitor the positions of workpieces and, uh, and so on, uh, and uh, dimensions and sizes and movements of all kinds of things, and you can put them in feedback loops, and they, uh, they improve things for you. Then laser shows, I don't know, I don't keep up with laser shows, but every time I see them, they always fascinate me because I'm always curious about what kind of lasers they're using. And today they can use them to write all kinds of patterns and, uh, and, and messages and so on uh, for people. Then there's the computer interconnects. These are the fiber optics or integrated optics that are being used for, for connecting uh, computers or even connecting uh, boards. And... Uh, and hopefully uh, sometime in the near future we will see uh, all optical computers. Now these will be very fast based on these mode locked uh, very short pulses and uh, but there are a lot of challenges and uh, hopefully some of these challenges will be overcome. Then in terms of high density memories, well we are already seeing that now and, uh, and then but hopefully there will even be uh, even more dense, you're taking advantage of, uh, of three-dimensional uh, structures and so on. And finally, I'd love to see some uh, color holography becoming, uh, bec becoming popular so that we can have all sorts of color holograms around, uh, around uh, our workplaces, around our homes, uh, and so on. It's a, uh, it was, so far, there's all kinds of kind of holography available, but the true color holography, even though it is feasible, we haven't, we haven't seen them at least uh, that available so that one can uh, purchase them and uh, put them up on the wall. I see that, uh, that my time is, uh, is close to coming up uh, to an end, and I hope that I've been able to, to get some ideas across to you, again, without, without scaring you off. Certainly I hope that for those of you who didn't have too much background, I hope you have motiva motivated you, take some interest in lasers, in fiber optics, and maybe you can find some new applications uh, for them because the field is, is very young and it needs, it needs some more energetic people that will come in, and especially from, from different fields. It's not always, you want, shouldn't always uh, talk to people in, in, in the optics and laser field. One should be talking to, to others in other fields. Maybe they'll recognize, they'll recognize uh, some new applications. As we can see, there are really so many applications of, uh, of lasers and fiber optics. Now, be before I close, I, uh, I'd like to thank uh, two of my uh, graduate students, uh, Steve Smith and Farhad Zarinechi. Uh, now, uh, I have put them in a circle here because it's uh, difficult to uh, choose uh, between them. Uh, uh, although Farhad Zarinechi has now uh, graduated 
uh, Steve Smith is, uh, is uh, going to be graduating soon, and uh, they've helped uh, considerably in the, in the creation of the, of the demonstrations and also in the creation, uh, creation of, the, of these visuals. Uh, I hope that you found them uh, uh, readable and, and without, uh, without a strain. So I think I'm, I'm almost dead on time and I'd like to thank you for, uh, for listening. And, and if you have any questions or so on, I think you have our phone numbers here at MIT. And you can call and we can continue with this uh, uh, conversation. Goodbye for now.